Thank you, Seth, and good morning to all of you. We are deep into our study in the book of Joshua, and we're in chapter 22. And rather than read the whole chapter, I'm going to read the first 12 verses, beginning with verse 1. Then Joshua summoned the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh and said to them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have listened to my voice and all that I commanded you. You have not forsaken your brothers these many days to this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brothers as he spoke to them. Therefore, turn now. And go to your tents, to the land of your possession, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the Jordan. Only be very careful to observe the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, to love the Lord your God and walk in all his ways and keep his commandments and hold fast to him and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their tents. Now, to the half, one half tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given a possession in Bashan, but to the other half, Joshua gave a possession among their brothers westward beyond the Jordan. So when Joshua sent them away to their tents, he blessed them and said to them, Return to your tents with great riches and with very much livestock, with silver, gold, bronze, iron, and with very many clothes. Divide the spoil of your enemies with your brothers. Sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh returned home and departed from the sons of Israel at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go to the land of Gilead, to the land of their possession, which they had possessed according to the command of the Lord through Moses. When they came to the region of the Jordan, which is in the land of Canaan, the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh built an altar there by the Jordan, a large altar in appearance. And the sons of Israel heard of it, saying, Behold, sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built an altar at the frontier of the land of Canaan in the region of the Jordan, on the side belonging to the sons of Israel. When the sons of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the sons of Israel gathered themselves at Shiloh to go up against them in war. The chapter ends well, but I'm going to stop there. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this uh, text of Scripture that we will consider this morning. It has uh, many great lessons for us, and I pray that you would teach them to us. Pray that we would keep your grace before us and we would understand that as um, your people were to do, as really Joshua exhorted those three tribes that would inhabit the other side of the Jordan to do, uh, to love you and to serve you faithfully. We will do that um, as we reflect deeply upon who you are and the abundance that you've given us as you gave all of those tribes abundant gifts and great blessing. So Lord, teach us about yourself and remind us of the things that we need to do and how we are to live our lives for you and live effectively for you. And we can only do that by your grace. And so Lord, teach us that, remind us of that. We constantly need to be reminded of who you are and what you've done, what you're doing, and uh, how you will always bless us richly. 
Well, Father, we pray for our material needs as well. We live in this age of the pandemic, and we have uh, some among us who are vulnerable, and we pray that you would bless them. We pray that you would uh, protect Madeline Hargrove and Audrey Harrell and Margaret Smith and keep them safe from all of this, but bless all of us with safety and wisdom. Protect us. We pray for those who are grieving. We pray for Al Martin's family, for Karen. We pray for Lee and his family as he continues to grieve following the, the uh, loss of Betty. Lost to us, but she is with you, and uh, we rejoice in that and rejoice that Al is with you as well. That is the hope we have, and perhaps even in this text we have a faint reminder of that as these tribes take their possessions, the riches that you gave them in battle, to their homes. And it speaks of the great blessings that await us, too, Father, as we finish the, the fight in this world, the spiritual battle that we're all in. So give us strength to, to endure spiritually and bless us materially, keep us safe. I pray, Lord, as well for the men and women who have jobs and businesses that may be uh, under some strain because of the, this pandemic. I pray that you'd protect their jobs, protect their businesses, prosper them in the midst of all of it. And may all of us prosper spiritually through this. And bless us spiritually now. We will never be blessed spiritually unless we study your word and stay in your word and continue to reflect on who you are and live for you. So help us to do that now, Father, as we uh, turn to our passage after this next hymn. I pray that you would prepare our hearts through it and, and bless us richly. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Actions always have consequences, sometimes good, sometimes bad. And so there's what we call or what is called the law of unintended consequences. We've all heard it. Plans are made, but maybe not carefully, and bad things happen. As when a British governor tried to reduce the number of cobras in India, by offering money for those who killed them. Uh, made sense, made sense to the people. They saw a profit to be made, but knew that more cobras meant more profit, and so they began breeding them. And the result was the cobra pop population increased. Good intentions don't always have good results. That, indirectly, is the lesson of Joshua 22, when three tribes of Israel built a large altar that had the potential for consequences far worse than snakes, and almost caused a civil war. It all begins well. Israel had fought a, year, uh, a war for seven years in Canaan, and now that was over. Uh, Canaanites remained in the land, but uh, the land was now Israel's possession. Its mission was accomplished. So as happens when wars end, the army was demobilized. That's how chapter 22 begins with General Joshua dismissing his troops. At the first group that was to be released was the Transjordan tribes, Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. They had obtained their inheritance, you'll remember, before the war, before they, rather the tribes crossed over the Jordan and uh, took the area of Canaan. And so before that, that's recorded in Numbers 20, 21, but before that happened, Moses had instructed them that while they possessed their possessions on the east side of the Jordan, they needed to join their brothers in the fight on the west side. And they were willing to do that. They crossed over the Jordan and joined the other tribes in battle. They had fulfilled their duty, and Joshua now released them 
with praise. They had been faithful to their promise to Moses and to their brothers in the fight. The Lord had honored their service. He had given the nation rest. And so they could go to their tents in the land of their possession. But Joshua released them with a strong exhortation in verse 5, and that was to obey the Lord. Only be very careful to observe the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God and walk in his ways and keep his commandments and hold fast to him and serve him with all your heart, and with all your soul. Joshua was as much a shepherd as he was a commander. He cared about the spiritual welfare of his troops, of all the people of Israel. And so he reminded them to observe the law. But notice the connection between obedience and love. They were to love the Lord and walk in all His ways. And that's always the right order in a relationship. Love guides and motivates good behavior. Obedience is not only outward. Obedience is first of all a condition of the heart. And when we love the Lord, that will bear fruit. The bear fruit in true worship, in deeds of kindness, it will bear the fruit of sacrifice for one another. And this is what Moses instructed in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. All your heart, soul, and might. Now, that's a command. But think about that. How do you command love? Well, it has been said by more than one theologian and said in different ways, but said that biblical ethics or morality, the, in, in that, the imperative proceeds from the indicative. Or we could say the indicative precedes the imperative. Now that may seem academic and grammatical, but really it's very simple. The imperative is, as you know, a command. The indicative in grammar is a statement of fact. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That is indicative. That is a fact. Love the Lord with all your heart. That is an imperative. It's a command. When we understand what the Lord has done for us, we will want to do the things that He's commanded us to do. When we understand what the Lord has done for us at the cross, saved us, made us a new creation, given us a new heart, given us the Holy Spirit, we will know that we can obey. We have the ability, supernatural ability, to do that because we are now a new creation. When we understand what it cost Him to redeem us, gain a new life for us, a new heart, new abilities to save us from eternal doom and give us eternal life and heaven forever, we will want to obey Him. And as Israel understood how God redeemed them from slavery in Egypt, gave them the promised land, conquered it for them, and I will add to that, was sending them a Messiah, sending the Redeemer, they would want to obey Him. But to understand that, they needed knowledge. They needed teachers of the law and prophets. That's the reason the Lord placed the Levites and the Levitical cities throughout the land to teach the people. So Joshua gave this exhortation. Love the Lord your God. Walk in His ways. Hold fast to Him. Serve Him in all your heart. Loving and holding fast to the Lord go together. Serving is the result of that. When we lack love for the Lord, when our hearts and our love 
grow cold. There may be service. There may be deeds. There may be a kind of worship, at least a formal worship. But it too is cold, as cold as our hearts are. It's formal, it's, it's a life that is legalistic, it is outward, it is not inward. Eventually, grace is lost, and people begin to see ceremonies and good deeds as meritorious, and it degenerates into a works religion. Israel fell into that, just as churches have. So Joshua told the three tribes to love the Lord and hold fast to Him. The, the only thing that will keep people from drifting spiritually is a vital relationship with the Lord. And that's why we need to keep reminding ourselves of the indicative, of the things that the Lord has done, of who He is, what He's done, what He's doing, what He's promised to do. Remember the facts that are contained in the Word of God. Continually go over them and remember them. So Joshua reminded them of this, blessed them, and sent them home with a load of treasure. Uh, now that alone reminds them, reminded them of the goodness of God and the value of faithfulness. He told them to return with great riches and with very much livestock, with silver, gold, bronze, iron, and with many clothes. Gold, silver, the clothes, reminds us of someone. Someone earlier in the book, Achan, at the beginning of the campaign, when he violated the ban at Jericho, and he took from the spoils that were dedicated to the Lord. He saw a Babylonian garment must have been a magnificent piece of clothing. A hundred shekels of silver and a bar of gold. You think about it. It's tempting. You can understand what tempted him. And he did what he shouldn't have done. He yielded. He took them. As he confessed in chapter 7, I saw, then I coveted, and took he hid the things, but the sin of Achan was discovered, and he lost his life. He lost everything. Now here at the end of the campaign, some seven years later, the tribes are leaving, having finished their mission. And they were leave, leaving with very much silver and gold and clothes. If he'd waited, Achan would have had all of it. He, if he had been obedient, if he had been patient, if he had persevered in the mission, he would have had all that he wanted and much, much more than he stole. Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. The eastern tribes did that. They were patient, obedient, and they obtained very much. Bunyan told a story in Pilgrim's Progress about two boys, passion and patience. Passion was given a bag of playthings, toys and goodies and things that really a child would love. And he laughed at patience because patience didn't have anything. But soon passion's things were all broken and used up and he had nothing. But patience waited for the better things. He didn't waste his time on things that don't last. And he received the best. He received the permanent. Patience is difficult, but it has its reward. And the eastern tribes returned home loaded with riches from God and the strong encouragement from Joshua to share the wealth. At the end of verse 8, divide the spoil of your enemies with your brothers. About 40,000 soldiers from these Transjordan tribes had fought in Canaan, but other men remained home to, to cultivate fields and protect families. Uh, they were to have a share in the spoil as well. 
and it's a, a situation that presents, I think, must have, to some degree, a temptation for these eastern tribes, but it's like the, the crisis that David faced in, in, second, in 1 Samuel chapter 30 when he and his men pursued the Amalekites who had burned Ziklag, which was the home at that time of David and his men, and they had not only raided the city and taken the possessions of David and his men, but they'd taken their women as well. They were captives, and so... 400 men went after the enemy, but 200 were too exhausted to pursue, and so they stayed behind to guard the baggage. After the battle, those who fought did not want to share the spoils of victory with those that had guarded, but David objected to that. He, pre he, he prevented that. He said, as his share is who goes down to the battle, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage. They shall share alike. Now, some people have a more direct role in the spiritual battle, the spiritual conflict, publicly at least, and, and the Lord's service. They have more in a kind of obvious way than others, but all play a role. All are in the fight one way or another, and all are to be blessed for it, and all will be blessed by the Lord. Well, as we understand that, I think all of us, and this was true of these tribes, understood the love of the Lord as He has provided them with so much and has provided us with so much. As when, when one understands that, I think then it becomes far more natural. In fact, I know that it becomes far more natural to give, to sacrifice. So Joshua sent off his troops like an anxious parent, someone has said, who sees a son or a daughter leave home for college and has the concern that the separation from them and this new environment may cut them off from the spiritual influences that they want them to have. And in the same way, Joshua sent these men off to their territory beyond the Jordan, separated from the other tribes and the sanctuary. And he did so, no doubt, with concern for their spiritual well-being. He's expressed that in verse 5. But the tribes of Reuben, Dan, and Manasseh shared that concern. They, they understood the circumstances, the geography of their circumstances. They had that concern. And when they approached the Jordan, before crossing it, verse 10 states that they built a large altar on that west side of the Jordan in the land of Canaan. Uh, the Jordan is uh, not a very large river, but it runs through a deep ravine. In fact, the name Jordan comes from the Hebrew word for descend, yarod, or go down, because it runs from the hills of Galilee down to the Dead Sea, which is below sea level. In fact, the Dead Sea is the lowest point on the earth. So the descent is, is steep, and the valley is deep through which it runs, making it a significant barrier between the tribes that could discourage travel from the east to the west into the sanctuary at Shiloh. And so understanding that, understanding the difficulties that that river might present for them, they built a big altar on the west side of the Jordan that they could see from the other side of the Jordan and that would remind them that they had a part in the altar of Israel. Now, this was in keeping with the policy that we saw earlier in the book of uh, the tribes crossing the Jordan and building memorials to be a reminder. There's that one that placed the 12 stones in the Jordan River and they placed 12 stones on the side of Canaan to remind them that this was their possession. They built these monuments periodically throughout all of this time of, of conquest and uh, did so to remind their descendants of what the Lord had done for them and bringing them out of the desert, bringing them out of Egypt and through the desert and across the Jordan and into the promised land and then the conquest that followed. 
remind them of the Lord and what he had done. And that's what these three tribes did. It was to remind them of their unity with the Western tribes and the necessity of true worship with them. That was the intent. But news of the altar traveled quickly and, and it was misunderstood to be an act of apostasy, of turning away from the Lord, and almost resulted in war. Verse 12, when the sons of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the sons of Israel gathered themselves at Shiloh to go up against them in war. The reason for this response is, is found in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses' instruction there in chapter 13, verses 12 through 15, where Moses instructed the people that if any of their cities said, let us go and serve other gods, they were to utterly destroy that city. Now that's how serious idolatry is. And the reason the tribes were ready to go to war Francis Schaeffer, who wrote a, a nice little commentary on the book of Joshua, wrote, that is just terrific. We ought to play the bagpipes. Uh, bagpipes were traditionally used to lead the Scots into battle and uh, scare the enemy. And the reason Dr. Schaeffer applauded their response was that they were being, as he put it, valiant for truth. Ready to defend it, defend the truth, defend the Lord, and keep worship pure at any cost, even that of fighting old friends. And it is a reminder that uh, the Word of God and the integrity of the Word of God is more important than compromising it for a friendship. Now, they were ready to go to war against their brothers, their former comrades in arms. But they didn't act in haste. Moses also said they were to first investigate, and so they appointed a delegation led by Phineas to do that and make certain the report that they had heard was true. Phineas was a wise choice. He was the son of Eleazar, the, the high priest, and a man who had proven his righteous zeal for the Lord when he put down apostasy in the camp. It, it happened at Peor when Midianite women seduced Israel, Israelite men, and Phinehas stopped it by slaying an Israelite and a woman that he was with. It is, uh, it's found in Numbers 25. He was the great defender of the faith. And he led the delegation of ten princes to the land of Gilead. When they arrived, they asked them what they'd done. Why had they rebelled against the Lord by building this altar? Well, they were reminded these three tribes of the, the previous apostasy, the iniquity of Peor that I just referred to. Remind them, Adam, verse 17, and of the plague that it brought on Israel, one that was only stopped when Phineas took the action that he did. And their act in building an altar would, would provoke the Lord's anger against the whole nation. In verse 20, they remind them of Achan and his unfaithfulness and how the sin of, of that one individual affected the whole congregation, led to the defeat at the Battle of Ai. The sin of Peor was a corporate sin. It involved a number of Israelites. Achan's sin, though, was an individual sin. But both resulted in the congregation suffering greatly. Sin, even in one person, is dangerous. It is contagious. It, it permeates the congregation. Paul understood that. He speaks of that in 1 Corinthians 5, and verse 6, or sin in the church at, uh, at Corinth. And, and he tells them they had to deal with that and then speaks about uh, the danger of a little leaven, leavening the whole lump, to get rid of the leaven. That's what takes place at Passover. 
when they remove all the leaven from the house. He uses that as his illustration. Well, they warned them, this delegation did, of that very problem that uh, they put the nation in jeopardy of judgment. But they made a generous offer in verse 19. If, however, the land of your possession is unclean, then cross into the land of the possession of the Lord where the Lord's tabernacle stands and take possession among us. Only do not rebel against the Lord or rebel against us by building an altar for yourselves besides the altar of the Lord our God. These were men seeking to avoid war and to avoid the Lord's discipline as well. Um, That's part of, of what it means to fear the Lord. It means to recognize that sin results in divine correction. That's not pleasant. Now that's true today of the church. Acts chapter 5 gives the case of Ananias and Sapphira who lied to the Holy Spirit. The consequence was both died. Luke wrote, great fear came upon the whole church, and rightly so. Now our highest motivation for obedience, and what I uh, stress somewhat in this passage, is not fear of discipline, but love for the Lord and loyalty to the truth. But fear of discipline is wise, because God will deal with His children severely if necessary. Read Revelation chapter uh, 2 and 3. And Israel showed wisdom here and and devotion to the truth and righteousness. But the people also showed what Francis Schaeffer called the practicality of love. They were ready to make a big sacrifice for these three tribes and share their inheritance with them in order to preserve unity and preserve purity. It, it, it's similar to what the early church did in Jerusalem when Christians shared what they had with one another and had all things in common. It wasn't forced upon them. It wasn't some uh, improper political system that uh, is exhibited there. This is something they did because they wanted to do it. They loved one another and they shared where they saw needs. Uh, here we see that same kind of spirit. Now, That offer was not only generous, it was smart. Proverbs 25, verse 15 says, A soft tongue breaks the bone. Uh, A gentle, kind response is powerful. It helps avoid conflict. And it did here. These eastern tribes could have taken offense at the charge that was made against them and responded in anger or uh, stormed off to their tents. But they didn't do that. And I think that the proposal here helped to, to quiet them. They, they were righteous men also and showed concern over the matter and recognized or explained that it was a misunderstanding. And they an- answered uh, this charge very solemnly in, in verses 22 and 23. They invoke God as their witness. It's very interesting how they do that. They, they do it twice, and they do it with three names of God. I don't know that we can make too much of that, but in a court of law, the law said two or more witnesses must be used, and here they use the Lord and three names of the Lord to do it twice, to give witness twice. We read in verse 22. The Mighty One, God, the Lord. The Mighty One, God, the Lord. He knows, and may Israel itself know, if it was in rebellion or if an unfaithful act against the Lord, that is, this altar was unfaithful, do not save us this day. In other words, we will submit to to judgment if we are guilty of what you said. Then they explain the reason for the altar. 
It wasn't an act of apostasy. It was just the opposite. It was because the Jordan separated them and they feared the separation would result in the western tribes cutting off the eastern tribes from the Lord. Verse 24, but truly we have done this out of concern for a reason, saying, in time to come, your sons may say to our sons, what have you to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? For the Lord has made the Jordan border between us and you, you sons of Reuben and sons of Gad. You have no portion in the Lord. So your sons may make our sons stop fearing the Lord. So idolatry wasn't the motive for the altar, just the opposite love for the Lord and the desire to protect their children from faithful, faithlessness, protect their children from idolatry was the reason they built it. It wasn't built as a rival shrine. It wasn't built for sacrifice. It was built to be a witness. That's what they call it in verse 27 between the tribes, both, the, the, both tribes on either side of the Jordan. And then they repudiate any evil motive. Verse 29, Far be it from us that we should rebel against the Lord and turn away from following the Lord this day by building an altar for burnt offering, for grain offering, or for sacrifice beside the altar of the Lord our God, which is before His tabernacle. So the reason, their reasons for building the altar were good. Their heart was in the right place, as we say. We can't question that. They showed genuine concern for the spiritual welfare of their children. What we can question, though, is their wisdom in not consulting the other tribes before building that altar. And we can question the need for such an altar. It's not as though the Lord had left them ill-prepared. They had the instruction of the Word of God. They had Levitical cities nearby where that instruction could be given. In the law, the command is given that all male Israelites are to appear at the sanctuary three times a year. Obeying that would maintain the unity that they wanted to preserve. Also, the Lord had not instructed them to build the altar. They did have some precedent for it, as we've noted, with these memorials that had been built earlier at the Jordan. They were for a witness. But this one had definite religious form, uh, uh, and, and could possibly have been adapted to a religious function or become a shrine which made it a, a, an, an altar of potential danger with unintended consequences. That happens. The bronze serpent that Moses made and was the means of healing those people who the fiery serpents had bit in the wilderness that was kept by the Israelites. It was valued by them. And you can understand why. It was a good thing. And it had been the means of great blessing. In fact, God prescribed it. Why wouldn't they keep it? But it became an idol later in Israel's history. It was called Nehushtan, which means piece of bronze. And so this thing became a kind of idol, and it was Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, who led a great reform in Israel, and when he did, he broke it to pieces, destroyed it, because the Israelites were burning incense to it. It was good, but it became a problem, a stumbling block for the people. And, and that sometimes happens when innovations in worship are introduced they, they may have been developed to instruct or to guard against error and to promote worship, but they can lead 
as we said earlier, to formalism, to routine, lifeless worship that becomes ritualistic and, and spiritually dead. So while the altar that the eastern tribes built never became a problem for them, the concern of the other tribes had merit. It had the potential of becoming a problem. And it was unnecessary. God had not failed to provide sufficiently for any of the tribes of Israel. Faithfulness to His Word was all that was necessary. And it's all that's necessary for us today. It's interesting to note. I think it's significant. The emphasis of the Bible is on hearing, not seeing. A lot of emphasis on seeing and, and, and ritual and all in the Old Testament and Israel's religion, but in the New Testament it's very different from that. The emphasis is on hearing. And men like seeing. They like objects and pageants and ceremonies and things of beauty. That's just human nature. So many churches, good churches, go for liturgy. They go for repeating creeds. It's dignified. The, the substance of it is often good. But it can lead to a kind of formalism, a mindless, empty ritual. That's a danger. I'm not intending to criticize any of those churches for that uh, any more than I really am criticizing this altar. But there is a danger unintended consequences, even with helpful things when they are not prescribed by the Bible. The essence of the spiritual life is given by Joshua in verse 5. It's not ceremonies. It's love the Lord your God and hold fast to Him. Then and only then will we obey and serve Him with all our heart. And what that requires is what we already have, and that is the Word of God. That is its emphasis, hearing it, hearing God's Word. That's Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the Word of Christ. That is what the Holy Spirit uses to nourish our souls and to give us spiritual growth, to give us understanding, to give us wisdom and maturity. It requires effort on our part. It requires consistent reading and study of Scripture. If we neglect that, we suffer. We need to be hearing the Word of God in our heart. And as we study Scripture, we discover that provision for the church for its worship, for its government, for our instruction, for discipline. Provision for that is complete and simple. We don't need to improve on it, just follow it. Now because the western tribes went to the three eastern tribes, spoke to them, investigated the matter, the whole incident ended happily. With Phineas saying, Today we know that the Lord is in our midst because you have not committed this unfaithful act against the Lord. Now you have delivered the sons of Israel from the hand of the Lord. That is, delivered us from discipline. Following that, Phinehas and the princes with him returned to Canaan to give their report. It was well received. The chapter ends beginning with verse 33. The word pleased the sons of Israel, and the sons of Israel blessed God, and they did not speak of going up against them in war to destroy the land in which the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad were living. The sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad called the altar witness, for they said, it is a witness between us that the Lord is God. The lessons for us in all of this, I think, are first of all, don't Make rash decisions. Investigate a matter before making a judgment. Second, guard the truth. Defend the faith. We must be equipped 
and ready to do that. In, in the words of Jude, contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. We're all to be doing that and equipping ourselves to do that, to know the Word of God and be able to defend the faith. The third lesson, by implication at least, is be cautious and biblical. Remember the law of unintended consequences. We may think we have a new and a better way of doing things, but beware. Programs may be introduced for a good reason, maybe to promote, promote growth in a congregation, increase attendance, but they may end up increasing the population of snakes, cobras. The best path is Follow the Word of God. That is true for a church. Christ is the head of the church. We should always look to Him. And how do we do that? We do it in two ways. We do it in prayer, and we do it in study. Pray. He hears. He answers. And follow His Word. That's the way for personal growth for each one of us. It leads to love for the Lord, which results in obedience and service. And service results in great reward. Not necessarily in this life. In fact, in this life, we may be tested severely and we may lose much. Those Christians to whom the author of Hebrews wrote had lost possessions and had uh, lost freedom. And that may happen to us someday. We may even face this, this stake, as many martyrs have, but that itself has its great reward. Not here, but in the world to come. And I think that's pictured in these tribes, going back to their inheritance with great riches that were shared with those who worked while they fought. And that's where our wealth is. It's in the inheritance that we have, the future the kingdom to come. It's what Christ spoke of in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Don't store up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. Store up treasures in heaven where they're safe, where we have them for all eternity. Don't live for time, live for eternity. So how are you living? What are you living for? Are you living for the Lord and for eternity? Now that's a question that we all need to be asking ourselves and asking ourselves continually. But there's another question that needs to be asked. Do you know the Lord? If not, you are lost. You are guilty. All have sinned, Paul reminds us. Be forgiven. Be found. Come to Christ. He's the Savior who died for sinners. He receives all who trust in Him. So believe and be saved. God help you to do that. Help all of us to seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank You for this great text of Scripture. Um, it's full of lessons for us. But certainly we are reminded what is chief, what is most important by the instruction that Joshua gave to those three tribes as they left. Love the Lord your God. Walk in His ways. Hold fast to Him. Lord, we will do that only by Your grace. And so, Lord, we pray for that grace and mercy for each one of us. Give us a profound love for you. To have that, though, we must be learning about you, reading your word, studying it seriously. So enable us to do that. Draw us close to yourself. And in so doing, give us fruitful lives that are a blessing to those around us, a blessing to ourselves, and most importantly, a blessing to you. We pray these things in Christ's name, Lord. And as we do, we ask you to prepare our hearts for this time of worship as we take the Lord's Supper. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.
It's a good practice uh, we have, I think, to read a passage of Scripture before we observe the Lord's Supper that particularly points us to our Lord's saving work on the cross, since that's the very thing he insisted we remember when we participate in his supper. In 1 cha uh, Peter chapter 2, uh, we have one of those passages. Uh, Peter's thoughts there have turned to suffering. And I know that quite a few of our members have suffered lately or are suffering, so I know that you can relate to Peter's words. We all can, uh, beginning in verse 21 of 1 Peter chapter 2, we read, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. When we partake of the bread of the Lord's Supper, we remember that Christ suffered. Uh, the bread and the wine uh, point to that in the sense that Jesus invested in them the symbols of his suffering. The bread, he said, representing his body delivered over to death, and the wine, his blood shed for many so that he might give his life as a sacrifice in our place. He was the suffering servant, uh, Isaiah tells us. Jesus said, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And all those who participate now in the Lord's Supper, uh, we are a part of that many. What a wonderful thing. That doesn't mean that our participation in any way merits that, only that Jesus directly said when he took the bread, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, when he took the cup, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood shed for many. Do this in remembrance of me. What a privilege it is for us, all of us who belong to him on account of his suffering in our place to honor him now uh, in this manner. By his wounds, we are healed. And so we invite all who have trusted in him for forgiveness, for the salvation that he has purchased, to acknowledge that now by participating in the Lord's Supper with the bread and then the wine. Now let's give thanks for the bread. Father, we do uh, welcome this opportunity to receive the bread. And as we receive it, to remember you in the sense that we, re we recognize and give thanks and contemplate the sacrifice that you made. Uh, you gave yourself upon the cross for our sins and by your wounds we are healed. We understand by that uh, that it is the most wonderful healing of all. Uh, we are healed from the illness and the condemnation that is ours because of our sin. And now there is no condemnation for us because you took it upon yourself on the cross. And we give you thanks for that now in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm reading Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's all. We have peace with God through faith alone in Christ alone. Now, why is that? Why isn't it required of us that we do something far more than that? Pay penance, go on pilgrimages to some holy shrine, 
do endless works of charity, beat ourselves black and blue? The answer is because Christ has done it all. On the cross, He paid the full penalty of our sins. His sacrifice satisfied God and satisfied Him completely. Which is to say, His sacrifice is completely sufficient. Anyone who tries to add to that is denying that fact. It's sufficient for forgiveness and eternal life for everything. It's by believing in Him as our God and Savior that we join ourselves to Him, join ourselves to His life and to His work, to His atonement. If you've done that, you've received His gift of salvation through no work of your own. And this cup speaks of that and reminds us of what He has done and the great gift that we've received through faith alone. Let's give thanks for the cup. Father, we do thank You for this all-sufficient sacrifice Your Son made for us. And You will call Him Jesus, for He will save His people from their sins. And that's what He did. We thank You for the price He paid for us. Great price that we could never have paid. Help us to reflect deeply on that as we take the cup, we pray in Christ's name.